So uh, just briefly, um, you know, esophageal strictures, super important, super common. Um, I, I would say on a daily, multiple times a day basis, I'm, I'm dilating uh, an esophageal stricture in my endoscopy practice. And so um, I, I see it all the time. And um, I, uh, the causes are, 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 are various, but most common are peptic and radiation. There's others, um, caustic, the occasional caustic injection, accidental or, or intentional. Um, Sometimes we cause strictures with our therapies, the occasional anastomosis. There's other things, rare diseases that can cause strictures that are far less common. Most of the time we're talking about peptic and, and uh, the tough ones are often the radiation ones. Um, what you don't want to miss are neoplasias um, and uh, motility disorders. So um, the, everything that I kind of told you before is, uh, and what I'm going to tell you, tell you subsequently, doesn't really apply to um, uh, cancers or, or achalasia. So, um, and they have very distinct, you know, if you're careful, uh, appearances that are different. There's a just the pre-poem um, spastic LES on the upper, and then uh, in the middle a very subtle um, uh, T1 cancer just before we ESD, uh, kind of tucked in the hiatal hernia sac. Uh, most strictures are probably easy. Um, they're defined as simple by being short, focal, traversable with the endoscope. They generally respond to uh, a few sessions of standard dilation. You don't need to do anything special. They're often minor peptic strictures or, or Schatzky's rings or benign webs. And they look kind of like that. They, um, they, they look like a little focal ridge or, or a web that's a little Schatzky's ring. They're very easy to, to deal with. Just because you can drive your scope through, though, doesn't mean the patient doesn't have dysphagia from it. So your scope, you know, depending on the manufacturer, the size scope, somewhere between, you know, 8 to 10, maybe 11 if it's been serviced a lot, um, uh, millimeters out or diameter. Um, to get relief of dysphagia, you need to be above somewhere between 12, 13, 14 millimeters. So um, what we're really talking about is, is complex strictures. So what makes something complex? Um, it's kind of you know it when you see it a little bit, um, but uh, it's long as opposed to focal, multifocal as opposed to, to unifocal. You can't quite get um, through it with an endoscope, um, or, or particularly with a standard endoscope, but even if you're only able to traverse it with, with a uh, ultra slim scope, I'd consider it complex. Uh, angulated, irregular, or associated with, uh, with inflammatory changes, esophagitis. So there's a, there's a few kind of gnarly looking strictures there, um, and and I would characterize those as complex. Some of the the weirdest ones are those that have these bridging uh, webs of of tissue from severe inflammation that's healed into a, a bridge, and um, I'll show you a picture of that later. Um, so my, my my mentor at Penn, Mike Coachman, published an editorial some time ago because um, there was a lot of papers about. Uh, strictures and, and, and people were calling things difficult without any standard definition, definition. So he came up with this and it's been affectionately called the Coachman Criteria. And it's useful in research because then we're kind of all talking about the same thing uh, when we're talking about difficult strictures and, and um, uh, treating refractory or, or recurrent folks. So a refractory stricture is one that you can't uh, successfully get to at least 14 millimeters over five sessions at two week intervals. And so that last part is really important. If you just dilate someone once and, and say, call me when you need me, um, but they still have dysphagia, that's not really refractory. You have to kind of pound on it every week or two. And if they're still unable to achieve uh, an adequate diameter, then, then that's refractory. Recurrent is um, not so much that you can't get to it, but they, uh, they, they can't maintain it. So. If you bring them back, um, maybe you've dilated to, uh, to 14, you're able to achieve it, but when you bring them back, it looks like it, it shrunk back down. Um, they're distinct and often, you know, they're, all, they're kind of both refractory and recurrent, but if you can kind of distinguish those in your head, it may help you about, well, do I need to maybe dilate more frequently or more aggressively or use adjuvant uh, kind of techniques? Uh, importantly, it's not meant to... Um, include patients that have inflammation that hasn't really been treated. So if uh, they're non-compliant with their PPI or, or if they need uh, one of the newer medications that Dr. Gluckman mentioned, um, 
then um, you know they don't really count. You have to get the inflammation healed first, which sometimes is, is easier said than done. So um, why would someone have uh, inflammation that doesn't go away? Um, they're they're non-compliant. They're PPI resistant, which is, is probably relatively uncommon, but not 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 non-existent. Um, they um, uh, I'm not sure why sucralfate is in there. That's supposed to be um, a means of treating um, poor clearance. Probably some of my hardest strictures are scleroderma patients because. They have poor gastric emptying, they have poor esophageal uh, um, motility, they have wide open LESs, they can be on you know, acid suppression till the cows come home and they still seem to have uh, refractory inflammation and strictures. Radiation is, is kind of a really, really tough type of stricture to deal with. They tend to be, they tend to be tight, they tend to be uh, multifocal and complex. They tend to behave more scary than peptic strictures, so you know if you're not careful that you can perforate them. Uh, hypersecretory states like Zollinger Ellison are relatively rare, but they can be a reason for um, refractory esophagitis and strictures. So your basic tools you're probably uh, pretty, pretty familiar with. Uh, most folks um, these days probably use a disposable balloon. Um, a lot of ambulatory centers may use uh, bougie dilators more commonly just because it's more perhaps cost effective. They have their advantages and disadvantages, uh, and we can talk about that in a, a little bit as well. Um, their steroid injection, I would say that's still, you know, although considered adjuvant, somewhat basic. Um, but I think one of the basic tools is ensure adequate frequency. You know, you want to make sure that at the, at the largest interval, if you're going to call someone recurrent or refractory, it's no later than two weeks, and I've, I've brought people back, um, you know, weeks or uh, one week or, or, or shorter even uh, to, to dilate. And it's, it's a matter of like a two steps forward, one step back until you start to make, make some progress. Um, a quick word about the difference between balloons and bougies. Um, for, for all dilation, uh, you're trying to achieve a diameter, but a, a bougie dilator, if you pass it, that's the diameter that you get. Um, whether you want to or not sometimes. <laughs> uh, a, a balloon, because it's 100% it's, it's non-compliant, right? It's stiff. A balloon, however, has some compliance. So you can achieve the pressure that the manufacturer nominally says is assigned to a diameter. But if your stricture is less compliant than your balloon, you may not actually achieve that diameter unless you prove it under fluoroscopy or perhaps with an uh, impedance planimetry type balloon. Uh, so... I, I, I say if you really want to kind of dilate someone, maybe think about a savory. Um, uh, if you really want to get to a certain, certain, and there's, you know, there's, there's axial for forces versus shear forces um, that you can talk about. And most of the data suggests they're relatively equal, um, but I think in practice, um, uh, all things being equal, a savory is probably a little more aggressive. So, so what are we talking about when we talk about additional tools? So you've done all those things and, and you're kind of like, all right, what, what else can, can we do? Um, this is really all I could kind of come up with. Uh, and there wasn't much, uh, really. Um, the big, big one is probably esophageal stents. And I would say when I, when I, when I was a fellow, um, it was, there was some excitement about, you know, this is going to be now the solution for refractory uh, esophageal strictures, as I'll show you with some data. That's been a little disappointing. Um, using uh, incisional stricturotomy, getting a needle knife or an ESD knife and trying to dissect the fibrosis uh, or the fibrotic stricture um, is, uh, is, is fun and cool, uh, probably ap applicable only to, to certain types of strictures that are uh, anatomically defined. Cryoablation or cryodilation is, has been used in pulmonary a lot. Um, when, I, when I talk to our interventional pulmonary colleagues, uh, they say, we don't really know if it's uh, super effective, but we seem to do it. And we're starting to do the same thing in, in GI. Uh, we don't really know if it's going to work, but some folks are using it. So there's a little bit of stay tuned in terms of the data of cryoablation, but I've used it for a few and um, we'll see how it works. Uh, topical or intralesional mitomycin C used probably more in the pediatric um, world and in the ENT world, although uh, we probably can and should use it more in GI. They use it in pulmonary as well. It's a little bit cumbersome to use because it's a chemotherapy agent and you have to handle it in the GI lab in, in a certain way. And so that, that has been a little bit of a barrier. 
Um, but I, I think I probably should be using it more than I do. Um, a combination of some of these things. Um, I have yet to um, prescribe self-dilation to a patient. Uh, I think uh, Mike Coachman had one that he had. Uh, he just sent him home with a Maloney dilator and he was doing it himself. I don't know really where you get a Maloney dilator anymore, but uh, you could probably do that. Uh, but that's that's actually in the algorithm, you know, self-dilation. You have to actually obviously have a highly motivated, you know, patient um, that's into that, I suppose. Uh, biodegradable stents um, have been described, you know, in interesting because of its 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 concept of, um, you know, there's not there's nothing that's um, implanted that you have to then remove with another procedure, perhaps less complications because it's biodegradable. So it was exciting. Um, the data is, is not all that great is the punchline. And as far as I know, not available in the United States. Um, so stricture incision, uh, useful for very select strictures, uh, short defined um, web-like strictures or these bridging fibrosis, this type of um, uh, uh, bridging, um, uh, strictures. I've seen most commonly in severe um, esophagitis that's healed in alcoholics. Um, they have multifocal uh, strictures, narrow caliber esophagus, these weird sort of uh, chicken pox uh, or, or pockmarked looking uh, esophagi. It's kind of funky. I think it's because um, probably, you know, they uh, throw up a lot when they pass out or, or the alcohol itself, but they get really rip roaring esophagitis and then there's this healing and, and re-injury and healing and ulceration. And then they get, you know, kissing ulcers in the esophagus that bridge. I've had, had a few patients and, um, they're very easy to incise and, you know, impresses the fellows. Um, <laughs> but it's very easy. There's, there's like almost no, you know, no risk there. Um, the other place where stricture incision really comes in, it's not relevant necessarily to this talk, but uh, anastomotic strictures are very uh, well suited and easy for, for incisions. Uh, but the radiation strictures, complex strictures, most peptic strictures, it's, it's not really well suited um, for standard kind of radial incisions. You could probably, if you're very careful in size and then dilate, um, but um, you know, that's um, a, a little bit higher risk. This is a anastomotic stricture um, uh, in a Ruin Y patient who had a very small pouch and a, and a refractory to, to multiple dilation sessions. And so um, we're showing a couple things here. This isn't esophagus, but, you know, he was having dysphagia. Um, functionally, it was almost like an esophageal stricture. Um, so it's very easy. You know, you kind of cut until uh, just before a perforation. That's, that's the key. <laughs> And then uh, I put a stent in for a little belt and suspenders, so the stent in, um, and he did really well. Esophageal stents, um, speaking of which, are, are not as, as, as good as you think. Um, it's very important that the patient follows up. Um, you know, uh, the longer that the esophageal stents stay in, for the, the more they're likely to cause harm, in, including catastrophic harm, tracheoesophageal fistulas, aortic fistulas, that can be fatal. Um, and so you want to make sure that the patient follows up. You want to make sure that you're placing as, as best you can uh, a fully covered um, stent so that's easily removable, although there are situations where you absolutely don't want something to migrate and you may, under select situations, use a partially covered stent. Um, the, uh, there are um, FDA-approved stents for benign strictures, but they're not the metal stents. They're plastic stents. Um, uh, so when you're using metal stents, it's off-label. Almost no one, except my coachman, I'm pretty sure, has plastic stents in their armamentarium. Um, you have to preload it yourself. It was very fun for the GI lab to watch me do that because it's very annoying to, to, to load it uh, and uh, I need to play it. Um, uh, but the, the data for them is not any better than, than metal stents. Um, migration is the main limitation, and fixation can help with stitching or clipping but it's not 100%, but it definitely imp can improve it. Uh, so here's some data um, about uh, uh, the success rate. And uh, you know, not to belabor this too much, there's, there's a lot of papers out there, but um, basically it, you have kind of like a 50-50 chance of doing any better than re re repeat dilation. You know, so it's not, you would think that you put the stent in, it's sort of, continuously dilating for the period of time that it's in there, you take it out and then they're liberated from dilation. The fact is at best that happens like half the time. 
Um, often you still have to redilate them. And I tell folks that are refractory, it's like, you know, we're going to be friends. Um, how frequently you want to see me depends on your esophagus. Uh, but it's often, um, you know, from someone who basically can't eat to just see me for dilation twice a year, three times a year, once a year, um, that's a success for some of these very difficult. Uh, but you start out with very frequent dilations and then increase the, uh, the uh, frequency. Um, but stents aren't harmless. This is a bronchoscopic view of a tracheoesophageal fistula from a stent um, that ended up being fatal. So we have to kind of keep in mind that um, it's not a it's it's not something that works all the time. And and you know when it does, um, it uh, um, when you do use it, you have to counsel patients about the risk. Um, so this is meta analysis, like I talked about. You know um, the uh, uh, it, it can work. Um, Migration is a big deal. Success rate is not much more than kind of a flip of a coin, and it's not without um, not without harm. Um, bleeding, perforations. Some pa some patients are very intolerant of esophageal stents, so just chest pain, and they want to get it out right away. Um, there's really no difference between like we talked about different types of stents. So I think you know we reach for esophageal stents out of desperation, uh, and we should reach for them perhaps in very limited uh, situations, but. For me to use an esophageal stent at this point for a benign indication takes a lot. Like I really have to have tried um, until I get to that point. Uh, cryoablation, this is a patient with a very refractory structure that I did not too long ago. The, um, the catheter is the white thing, the clear thing is the decompression tube, and the frost is the uh, cryoablative effect. Um, so I've used it out of, out of desperation um, in a carefully uh, uh, consented patient and, and there's an emerging experience in a few centers and um, but it's a little still too new to, to be part of the algorithm or recommend uh, so stay tuned um, uh, you know dilation can, can be sometimes scary I've, I've I must have done thousands of dilations I mean how, how many dilations do I do <laughs> a lot right so um, and and they can be scary. Sometimes you get these deep rents, and like I said, you want to you want to you want to dilate just just before a perforation happens. That's the perfect dilation. The problem is there's nothing built in to the balloon or the esophagus that says slow down, buddy. Um, so it's a lot of it is experience. You can use the rule of threes that everyone is sort of familiar with. Uh, you can always dilate more, um, but uh, you can't quite take back a, a, a perforation. So. The, the big hole is not the esophageal lumen. The, the esophageal lumen there is to the left. The, the perforation is to the right. This was a patient that I had dilated a lot, um, and then he, this was a radiation stricture, um, and then he had to go get um, additional radiation. He came back, and I only dilated into, I think this was like 12 or 13 tops, and I could get the scope through, and so very unexpectedly, um, you know, he perforated. And so we placed um, immediately a stent. This is a through the scope stent. Um, he was, I admitted him to the hospital. He, he, did, he did fine, brought him back uh, about a month later, took out the stent. The stricture was better, you know, um, and, um, but he's still gonna need, need dilation. Um, so some take home points. Um, Ensure that you're achieving an adequate diameter and frequency of dilation. That's probably the key thing to take away from this, is that before you kind of talk it refract, call it refractory uh, or recurrent, make sure that you've kind of taken a look at that Coachman criteria and uh, every two weeks trying to slowly get to um, roughly 14 millimeters. If those things haven't been achieved, uh, you still have some work that you could do. Treat the inflammation um, and know when to refer, but realize that when by the time they kind of come to us, um, it are, we have additional tools, uh, but their efficacy is actually not as, as good as one would like. So often it's just about being appropriately aggressive and, um, and frequent with dilation. Thank you.